Uncle Sam says nay to Starbase's second launch pad. Axiom astronauts say yay as they launch to the space station. We have plenty more missions booked for April, and we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. After Monday's first ever full cryo test for Booster 7, the following road closures were rescheduled for next week. Booster 7 was lifted off the orbital launch table during the editing of this video, and the Starship Quick Disconnect was dismounted from the QD arm so modifications could be made for Starship 24, which is currently being constructed up Highway 4, where the new wide bay is coming together. RGV aerial photography has discovered that, like the high bay, SpaceX is building some workspaces at the top. The high bay next door houses portions of Booster 8's methane tank, as well as Ship 24's LOX tank. On Tuesday morning, a fit check was conducted with 8's forward dome section and 24's skirt. And Starship 24's nose cone has received its flaps, as well as most of its heat shield tiles, as has its payload bay, which is possibly being used as a pathfinder for future Starlink satellite deployments. Meanwhile, Booster 4 is still waiting on its ride to pick it up, but Ship 20 was moved next to suborbital pad B. It's possible its testing days are not over yet. In the fall of last year, we discussed how SpaceX was working with the Army of Corps of Engineers to acquire a permit so they could expand their Starbase launch operations there in Boca Chica, Texas, which included a second landing pad and launch tower with all the needed ground support equipment. Well, on Wednesday, The Verge broke the story that the Army withdrew SpaceX's permit application on March 7th, citing a lack of sufficient detail in a letter to the company. However, once the requested information is received by the Corps, the process can be reinitiated. SpaceX's current permit does allow them to launch from their current pad, but as you know, with bigger government comes more government agencies, comes more hoops to jump through. SpaceX is currently waiting on the Federal Aviation Administration to approve an environmental assessment of the area so super heavy launches can take place. All of the above are contributing factors as to why Elon is having a second Starship super heavy launch pad built at the Cape as we speak. In fact, it's likely that the East Coast launch site is the reason SpaceX has appeared to have boarded their Starbase expansion work with the Army, at least for now. The future of Starbase, I think, um, it's, it's well suited to be kind of like our um, advanced R&D location. And, and then I think probably Cape Kennedy would be our sort of main operational uh, launch site. But speaking of big government agencies, the United States Agency for International Development said it played a part with SpaceX in connecting Ukrainians with Starlink Communications helping deliver 5,000 user terminals to the Eastern European government. But the agency removed a portion of the announcement after it was published. Thankfully, journalist Joey Roulette managed to capture a screenshot of the original that listed SpaceX donation at $10 million, and the American taxpayers' purchase of 1,333 terminals. Joey said the agency later clarified that they removed at least the first part because it was SpaceX and other private entities whose combined contributions totaled over $15 million. While I've said many times that I do stand with the people of Ukraine fighting for their lives against Russian aggression, I'm also compelled to point out the irony that the United States is claiming to be a defender of truth under this administration. As if Russia has a monopoly on propaganda. The good news is, the Americans in our government who really matter still recognize a patriot when they see one. Mr. Elon Musk. <laughs> on Thursday, Elon visited the U.S. Air Force Academy to deliver the IRC Eker lecture. My uncle graduated from there. Among the topics of his speech were Mars colonization, starships, space debris, and raptors. Quote, if we're not blowing up engines, we're not trying hard enough. Just minutes ago, SpaceX and Axiom Space launched the first ever crew of private astronauts to the International Space Station. Prior to liftoff, we got a glance of the SLS sitting at Pad 39B, but also the current progress of Starship's East Coast Orbital Launch Tower. Other parts of it are being built separately nearby at Roberts Road. At 11.17 a.m. Eastern Time, Axe 1 launched carrying two Americans, one Canadian, and one Israeli inside the Dragon spacecraft called Endurance on this Falcon 9 booster's fifth flight. Together, a new chapter begins. Godspeed, AX-1. Check out this cloud-looking landing. The camera's connections were solid the whole time. This first all-private crew, along with their zero-g indicator, Little Thumperhead, will spend eight days doing research at the space station before returning to Earth for splashdown. 
Next on the launch list is NROL-85, a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. Lifting off out of Vandenberg Space Force Base, California on Friday, April 15th. It will be the first NROL mission to use a reused Falcon 9 booster. NASA's next crewed mission to the space station is sadly no longer taking off on 420. Crew 4 is now targeting no earlier than April 21st for liftoff. And Astranus, or Astranus announced they have signed a dedicated contract with SpaceX to carry four of their Astra Anus Microgeo satellites to a custom orbit next year. These satellites are 1 20th the size and cost of traditional geo communication satellites, and the constellation will provide broadband connectivity to people wherever and whenever they need it. And meow, it's time for today's honorable mention. It's been a long wait for shoot lovers, brah, but Rocket Lab is finally ready to attempt to recover their first electron booster in midair. The New Zealand's company's next mission, there and back again, has a 14-day launch window that opens on April 19th. The rocket will deploy 34 payloads for multiple commercial customers, after which the first stage booster will re-enter the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean, pop multiple parachutes, then a nearby heli, a customized Sikorsky S-92, will attempt a skyhook maneuver to snatch the chute stick and return it to the owner back on dry land. In 2020, Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck told me that they were planning on conducting this test later that same year, but true to my documentary's theme, shoot recovery systems are awesomely complex. I recommend you give it a watch. Well, that's all for today. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, support and supporters in our locals community. You complete me. Have a nominal weekend. And until next time, Godspeed. <laughs>